and I had the camera reversed once again. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, but I see a couple of people are already here. I'm going to switch the chat over so more people can uh, chat faster. Newt's Commander, hello and welcome. I'm actually going to move the camera off of the tripod now. And I might use the tripod again if I need to do some things, but I think it's going to be easier for everyone to see if I'm just... If I can move the camera around a little bit and get close-ups like I can on this Dazimutilla Nocturna right there. And these two Dazimutilla, Dazimutilla Gloriosa right there in the middle. And this Cryptoglossa Muricata beetle. So, yeah. I see we've also got Cloud 9.5, Frank the Tank, Zero Cool, Hair Wade. Awesome. So, yeah, we're going to take a look. As you can see, these velvet ants, strangely, are feasting upon bits of sweet potato. That just seems weird to me because we think of them as eating, you know, very moist food as nectivorous uh, animals. But they do um, like sweet potatoes when my daughter puts them in there for the beetles, also for these guys. So, very cool. Oh, the... And I'm glad you're enjoying the velvet ants. These are so fun. Here's a, a red one. This is Dazimutilla vestita coming along here. That one hasn't shown up. Hadn't shown up, I don't think, in the live stream yet today. And I've got some desert beetles in here besides the Cryptoglossa muricata. We'll see if they show up as well. You never know exactly what you're going to get. It's kind of like a box of chocolates. So thanks again, Richard. I really appreciate your support. So yeah, we'll see if we get some more beetles. Um, most of my desert beetles are in my blue death finning beetle breeding, breeding enclosure because my most numerous species of desert beetle are the blue death finning beetles. I don't have any of those in here because I just want to see if I can get them breeding as much as possible. So, and they are. I've got a bunch of larvae in the incubator right now, so we'll see. But stag queen. Well, I hope your blue death finning beetles come soon. This one is... The scientific name is Cryptoglossa muricata, like I said, but it's known as the rough death feigning beetle. It does a pretty good job at feigning death as well, even though it's in a different genus. Actually, uh, as I once, uh, my understanding is that Cryptoglossa was originally the, the genus name of the blue death feigning beetle, and then it was moved to Asbolus. So, mile high tarantulas. So, on my end, uh, Sorry, just for a second. My camera acting up and fuzziness that people are saying. I think it's the stream. I do not think it's my camera because uh, on my end, it's it's very much in focus and it's not being jumpy or anything. So I think it's the, the stream is, is doing this to us, which I'm sorry for. The latency is probably messing it up. So sorry about that. So mile high tarantulas. I do not breed the velvet ants because they are not really bred in captivity, unfortunately. And this is one of the few creatures that I keep that are not bred in captivity. Um, I don't, you know, usually think that's a great idea to um, collect things that don't live in captivity. But I think it's important for people to know more about velvet ants. And when they see these things in the desert, not to kill them. Or, you know, in other places, because they live in other places too. And I think one way to do that is to uh, make a channel like this. Um, I hope to be able to breed them someday, but it's pretty difficult to do because they parasitize wasp larvae. So forest oasis, could you use an ABG mix modified with gravel and vermiculite for a leopard gecko? Hmm, I wouldn't necessarily use that mix because I feel like it would be, it would retain too much moisture uh, for a leopard geckos, for a leopard gecko, I'm thinking. Uh, so I, I like to use the mixture from the BioDude. I think it works really well for leopard geckos. But I'm sure there are other mixes you could use. I've seen some interesting videos on making your own bioactive substrate if you want to go to a cheaper route. So um, Leopard Gecko on YouTube has at least one of those. Um, so I'm glad the, the latency issues seem to be resolved. You can see that the, the rough death painting beetle is also nibbling on the, the sweet potato that my daughter just put in here a little while ago. Um, so Grilla Day. Yeah, this is actually sweet potato, but squash works similarly to it. So yeah, totally. I like to use squash for mine too. 
you feed them any kind of dry food? Yeah, I do feed them, not my, uh, I don't feed my velvet ants dry food, they don't really seem to go for it, but I do feed my beetles things like dry fish food pellets, I've done cat food and so on. Ooh, here's my Dizimutella occidentalis, my biggest velvet ant. She's probably like three or four times the mass of some of my smaller ones. She is a beauty, and I think she's come, she's smelled this, this new beetle jelly I just put in. Oh, I just scared her. She's a little bit more skittish than some of the other ones. Oh, she's ducking away. Sorry, I scared her. It's too bad, because seriously, she's, oh, she's coming out again, but she's over on the other, the other side of things. Take a look at this. I want to show you something while I'm checking out the chat. Um, this is, my daughter made a background for this tank that she painted, which is pretty cool. I think it's got the cacti and the choya wood. Even a little beetle crawling up the hill of sand in the background there, which I thought was pretty cool. I actually, she asked me what I wanted to do for, what she wanted for, what I wanted for Christmas. And I said, I'd love it if you made me a background for my, my beetle and velvet ant enclosure. So they did. So let's see. So grill a day, you get medium to large bags of animal feed and grind it up. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so amphibious aquatics. Do you think you will ever do a Morio beetle, superworm beetle, bioactive enclosure? I actually have one right now uh, with my uh, leopard gecko. I have superworms or Morio beetles, whatever you want to call them, um, living in there and breeding in there. I will occasionally throw larvae in there and then I'll let the, them pupate and I'll take some of the adults out and leave some of the adults in, but I found they, they're producing their own larvae in there too. And they will pupate in there just fine because they can find a place where they're secluded enough that they're not bothered by other ones and they will pupate just fine in there. So... So... For to take seriously! I guess if your oven, when it's off, is around 88 degrees, that that would work. How long did you get them to, how long did you keep them in there to get them to pupate? I've heard some beetles will pupate after just a short spike of temperature, and then they will develop perfectly fine at cooler temperatures. So that would be really interesting to know. Oh, Gorilla Day, that's a good, good idea. Thank you for sharing that with Forest Oasis. I do need to do some morning geckos. I actually need to redo some of my morning gecko enclosures, so maybe I'll do that on a stream. Uh, I've got one morning gecko enclosure where I had some ficus species Panama growing, and it was gorgeous. Loved it. And unfortunately, um, the person who was in charge of watering the enclosure didn't quite give it enough, and it dried out. And by the time I noticed, it was too late. So, and I needed to get better instructions, so that's on me, but at any rate, the, uh, the geckos are fine, but the plant, that particular plant died, and there are other, you know, there's other plant life in there, but, uh, I need to get that, I need to get that going. I need to plant something else in there. So, I mean, that would be, make a good stream, Carl's. And J.H.? So the blue death thing, you know, as far as I know, I mean, there can be some difficulty in telling them apart, but as far as I know, it's doing pretty well. And I'm, I've got mm, half a dozen larvae in the incubator right now. Ike, hello? So really, Frank, that's amazing. I've never had any pupate that fast, I don't think. So that's awesome. And Forest Oasis, you probably could add some bark or moss to the mix that um, Grew the Day suggested. I would say so. Um, you just need to make sure that you know, you're not retaining too much moisture. You do want to retain some moisture in the lower levels of the substrate, but not too much in the higher levels. That's kind of the thing. I wonder if I can zoom in a little bit on these little little ants. How is that working? Is that focusing well enough? Um, I hope so. I mean, sometimes you lose a little bit of uh, resolution when you, you zoom in, but I just want to see show you the little faces of these beautiful little beetles. They're just, I mean, beautiful little velvet ants, which are, of course, wasps. Okay, cool. So amphibious aquatics, I have been intrigued by those beetles. I need to look up 
whether or not they are legal in my area to have them shipped to me. If they are, I would love to do that. They sound very cool, and I've seen them, and they look awesome. So amphibious aquatics. Okay. So forest oasis. You're going to add some clay. Yeah, I wonder if you could go to... Like, they have the American stone shops around, if they would have clay or not. I don't really know. Okay, thank you, Ken and Ike. I'm glad it's looking good. Uh, you notice there's there are some... I don't keep it just sand in here. There are bits of vegetables that dry out, and I do periodically remove them. You can see some bits of those. You can see some leaf litter and so on in here. And that is partly to provide a more natural appearance, and partly, if I do get any beetle larvae in here, they're more likely to survive if there are bits of food in there. Some I do occasionally take them out, like I said, but I, there's always some in there. My Dazimutilla Nocturna is out. She's my little koala from uh, Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace. Love this little, little critter. He sent her to me quite a while ago, and she's doing really well. Um, she is one of the older velvet ants that I actually have in here. Uh, I do have two orange Dazimutilla Vestita, which are very shy. Um, I saw one of them not too long ago, so I think they're still in here. And one of them I've had well over a year. It's been probably close to a year and a half. And uh, they're doing, seem to be doing fine, but they're the two shyest velvet ants I have. And then I have two other Azimutilla vestita of the red variety, these here. They just seem to be the same species, but different color variations. They're not as shy, although the little one is more shy. This larger one is not as shy. And then the uh, white velvet ants don't seem to be shy at all. They're almost always out about both uh, the Desimutilla nocturna, this one here, as well as the Gloriosas, these two here. Very, very active. I haven't seen the dune buggies this evening. I've seen them recently, just in the last couple of days. But the dune buggy beetles that are in here, hopefully they'll be out and about in a little while. So... And Fishaholic, greetings. Nice to have you here from Scotland. That's awesome. So does this enclosure have any cleanup crew? Actually, the beetles serve as the cleanup crew. They don't really need any more than that uh, in here. And in, generally, in my beetle enclosures, there are larvae that are doing part of the job. I don't know if there are any larvae in here or not, because the species that are in here... I did have some Eleodes in here for quite a long time. They, in fact, predated the enclosure. At least some of them did. But eventually they passed on. They do pass on after a while. I've had them for a long time. So this spring, I'm going to have to go up into the hills, five-minute drive from my house, and collect some Eleodius beetles again, because I really like them. And... So JH, the water station. This, this water station, and this one particularly, this here, at the moment also has some sugar, it's just sugar water. And it's a tiny, tiny bit of salt for some electrolytes. These little wells fill up without leaking. They're awesome, love them. And I got these on Amazon actually. If you look up my uh, Velvet Ants, the best pet invertebrate video, there's a link, a direct link to these on Amazon where you can get them. And they're, the, the seller on Amazon is called Biformica. And these are 3D printed bases. The threads and everything are 3D printed. You can kind of see that if you look closely at it. And these little wells are 3D printed in such a clever way that if it falls over, you don't get a whole bunch of sugar water spilled all over. And if you fill it with sugar water, it doesn't leak from pressure. If you try honey water, it will cause a pressure leak because the honey will ferment and uh, build up gas and push it out. But if you just use sugar water, it works, works really well. Um, so... Oh, theropods. Congratulations on the Pinkfoot babies. That's very cool. And I am lucky that I can collect uh, some of these things. Like the, uh, the red velvet ant here, this species I can collect in my state. Um, this species I can collect in the southwestern extreme portion of my state. I have never collected this species, but it does exist there. And I've been in the area where they can be collected. Um, this one only exists in, I think, California. Um, at least it doesn't, it doesn't occur in my state, and it does occur in California. So, but I can collect 
a few different species of velvet ants in my state, I can collect quite a few different species of desert beetles, mostly Eleotis, but you can actually find blue death fanning beetles in the southwestern corner where the, uh, these white velvet ants come from. And, oh, and Ken, and that is a, that is a good point. Yeah, you could, you could just buy the plans online and print this yourself if you have a 3D printer. I'm thinking of getting one. There's a lot of cool things I think I could print, but I, I don't have one. Someday, maybe. And Gorilla Day, that's a good point. A humidity spike to 70% and a, a constant humidity of 70% is a huge difference. Yeah, kind of, and even though they prefer it more arid than, say, crested geckos, crested geckos respond well, morning geckos too, respond well to, to humidity spikes and then lower humidity than that for a while too. Just their general humidity is higher than that for for leopard geckos and and so on. So that's a, that's a very good point. So are we going to play guess that isopod and guess that beetle? Well, maybe. I need to... I don't know. I would have to arrange some things. Let me see if I can make that work. So which which velvet ant looks like a face? I'm curious. Hmm. I know they're not being very active. They're eating, but they're, they're not moving around a lot. Mr. Snake, it's been a while. Good to see you. Oh, in between the sweet potatoes. I think I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that beetle. Look at the pattern on the elytra of that beetle. Very cool. That is where it gets its name of rough death fanning beetle. Yeah, I use carrots a lot too, but uh, organic sweet potatoes are a staple in my bug room. Isopods like them. Uh, these velvet ants obviously and beetles like them. I give them to the superworms, give them to the isopods, give them to the mealworms, give them to the blue death fanning beetles. There's a lot of things I give them to. I even give them to my, uh, my scuds. Ooh, Stag Queen. I, I now I need to look up that Pokemon because I haven't seen them. I haven't seen it that I that I recall, but it sounds kind of fun. Okay, well, let's see. If we can get five more likes in the next minute, we'll do Guess the Isopod. How's that? Oh, well, we got four more likes almost instantly, so I think we can make it. Okay, we did it. We did it. Okay, that was fast, folks. Thank you. Hello, Moon Over Miami and BB Claws and Shane. Hello. Okay, so let me get the camera all set up here. And, sorry. I'm going to switch over to the table over here. It's going to take me a second. To do that so we can do guess the isopods thank you that was a lot of likes really fast folks that was fun um all right let me get some isopods over here and we'll get going we'll do it sorry the ceiling is really exciting i know um and yes, I do sometimes wear glasses when I'm looking at things up close. It's kind of a recent thing. I never needed glasses growing up or anything. But now when I'm reading the chat, it helps. So I do appreciate that. Um. <laughs> All right. So here is a species of isopod. Let's see who can get it first. I'm going for scientific name. I want the scientific name. So, Forest Oasis got the common name first, it looks like. Who can give me the, uh, the scientific name? They do resemble Oniscus, but it's not Oniscus. 
They've got the wide bodies in, in kind of a skirt pattern like Goniska's does. Let's see if we can get close up and take a nice peek at these. Frank de Tink is really close. So is Thoropods. So is Cloud, 9.5. Not quite there. Almost there. But Dilatatis is right. Porcelio Dilatatis. So the three of you really got close, and so did Forest Oasis got the, the common name first. I'm curious if this is a type of ice spot. You saw that one that was just trying to... Okay, Frank de Tank, you got it. Frank de Tank, you did it. I'm curious if they're going to eat in front of us. Some isopods will eat right in front of you. They don't care. And others are really, really picky about it. So, they, You're right. Ken has an uncanny ability to distinguish isopods that are not Dave. I've noticed that the last time we played this. Now, are we... Is it a little bit fuzzy now? I'm trying to... Hello, Simon. Joining us from Belgium. That's awesome. It's not awesome that you can't sleep, but it's awesome that you're joining us. Maple leaves are fine for isopods as long as they're not contaminated. Can everybody see what's going on over here? Does that even make sense, what's going on? Right here. Oh, we've got two, two Belgians in the stream. That's awesome. This is just beetle jelly. I put them in here so that they're not wasted. Once the, they kind of dry out after a week or so, and I hydrate them, you know, in between removing them, so I get the most use out of it for the beetles and the velvet ants. But I put them in something like this, like an a isopod enclosure, and they usually eat it. Depends on the isopod. Some like it more than others. Um, so, Forest Oasis, glad to hear you're... Your zebras are doing well. That's awesome. Really fun species, by the way. One of my personal favorites. Okay, let's let's look at another one. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Should I do an easy one or a difficult one? This one might be a little bit more difficult. Newt. You know, I bet if they were hungry enough, they would. I don't know how excited they would be about it, but I bet they would eat some uneaten crested gecko diet, especially if there's a little moisture to it and they were kind of hungry and thirsty. So. Okay, there's a big old magnolia leaf. I wanted to thank Brian for sending me a bunch of magnolia leaves and pods and some water oak and some acorn caps and so on. Okay, that was awesome of him to do that. This, which species of isopod is this? Notice there's a small juvenile in there that was born here. It's a new colony. So, cloud 9.5, you're close. Newt, you got it. Newt. This is Armadillidium nosatum whiteout. Yes, it is. Um, so, amphibious aquatics. Oh, you found an albino and now been breeding it. You have 10 to 20. Nice. Um, so, a lot of the work is done. Uh, I would say at least one generation from the wild type, two generations if you can do it. That would be good. So... So, this, this one is known as nosatum whiteout. Um, it may be known as super white as well, I'm not sure, but it's definitely a nosatum whiteout. One way you can tell um, nosatum morphs from Armadillidium vulgari morphs is that the nosatum morphs tend to be much less glossy if you're just looking kind of from a distance. There are other ways to tell when you get up closer. You see their little nose, for example. But uh, yeah, that's one way you can tell. <laughs> yes, you recognize Bob. This one right here is Bob. And Eddie, unfortunately not. She's not going for it. No roaches for me. Not a, not a roach. 
ever until I get my own facility, which is probably going to be the only way I can do that ever in the world. Okay, let's do... Hmm. <laughs> Just looking down at these isopods, seeing what I can find. Let's do this one. This one's fun. <laughs> Rough green snakes are really awesome. And I'm glad I can keep snakes, because if I can't keep brooches, at least I can keep snakes, and I love snakes. I absolutely adore them. Yep, this is a new colony, so there are definitely some fungus nets in this one. Okay, here we go. There's just one. Let me lift another rock. I mean, another piece of wood. That'll help. There we go. And as you notice, I'm combating those fungus nets with springtails. Look at those colors. Oh, okay. Frank to tank. Yep. That is what these are. This is, and Newt's got the whole thing, Peace Gaber Lava. Yep. Yep, I love this morph. This is probably my favorite Peace Gaber morph of all time, so far at least, because the, the richness of the color and the, the sharpness of the contrast of the different colors on their body is, is fantastic. So, yeah, the, the thing is that uh, the green snakes... The rough and the smooth green snakes subsist largely on insects. And because they do, you don't need to feed them rodents and, and whatnot. Uh, they, they can eat other things. They will eat small lizards and so on, for example. But they, they can be fine on a diet of supplemented insects. They're not terribly great captives, unfortunately, in many ways. But if you can get over the fact that they're kind of uh, skittish, and you keep them as a display snake, not so much as a handleable snake, then maybe you can do it. Okay, let's see what we can get from this species. I agree, Theropod Hunter. Springtails are the invertebrate hobby's best friend. It's true. And fungus nets suck. I also agree with that. And very hard to avoid in new colonies. But you eventually catch up. Okay, what are these cryptic little isopods? Of course, they're definitely springtails. I have to have to give you that. There are springtails in here. And there weren't very many isopods when I showed them to you. Let's see if I can find a few more of them. There's another, another one right there. Hmm. So far, forest oasis is the closest. Um, this species is sometimes known as dwarf gray or dwarf striped thoropod, so closest. Nagurus cristatus is the scientific name of this species. Dwarf striped, yep, you got it, forest oasis. Uh, kind of a funny species in that it will boom and crash. I used to have a huge, huge colony of it. And uh, it kind of died back and it's never recovered, which is weird. I mean, it's been years. It, it exists, but it just, it's never gotten back to the number where it used to be, which is weird. Okay. This is a trick one here we're going to do now. Say, so I'm just warning you, fair warning, it's a trick. Okay, so don't answer too soon. Um, so what do you think? Okay, Cloud 9.5, you got it. 
There are milkbacks and oranges in here. This is my project where I'm attempting to see if they will hybridize. So far, I'm getting lots of babies in here. Um, but none of them seem to be mixes. So my guess is that they're not going to hybridize because they must be different species. It's my increasing conclusion I tend to draw uh, that Porcelio labus milkback and Porcelius labus dairy cow are a different species than the other Porcelio labus we have in the hobby. I don't know if that's true for sure, but it just seems to seems to be that way. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Let's take a look over here. Who can get this one? I I saw a question from Eddie in back in the chat. I'm going to try to go back and catch that while we do this. Okay, Eddie, so you were saying, where was that comment? Oh, or not as dark south isopods coming. Do you have any tips for me on them? They like good ventilation. They need a dry area as well as a moist area. You want both. Um, they need a decent amount of space. They like their protein. And they will breed like crazy for you. They're one of the fastest breeding of the giant Spanish Porcelio that you can possibly get. One of the hardiest, too. This one's easy, but... Check it out. Sick, hello and greetings. And yep, that's Kevin on the left there, the larger one on the left side that's moving a little bit. That is Kevin. And Cloud 9.5, you have the right genus, but it's a different species. Oh, and there, there went Dave. Yep. Both Dave and Kevin in here. There you go, Thoropods. Pure not as high yellow. And Newt's Commander wasn't far behind. Notice that the, the adults have a much more vivid, rich, darker yellow. And the babies, which these two uh, young ones here and that one over there that you can barely see in the dark, uh, were born here. And they're putting on some size pretty fast, which is nice to see. But they're a much paler yellow, as you can see when I get close. It is a yellow, but it's kind of a, a pale yellow. And these adults are just completely rich and beautiful. So that's kind of fun to see. Let's see what else is under another piece of bark. Took a while for these guys to start reproducing, but once they did, they, they went for it. And this one here in the middle of the screen is a baby that was hatched here. Most of these that you see were hatched or born here. I guess it's sort of halfway in between for isopods. They come out of the pouch and everything. So it's kind of hard to say which one it is because it's sort of both. But anyway, let's see. Some more under here, including some of the young. And I just love the vivid color on these. So it's fun that the colony is it's getting bigger. Oh, Forest Oasis. Yeah, but it might be even cooler if you could get something that's a little easier to breed. I've heard the Horned Dragons, Horned Mountain Dragons are a little trickier. So, uh, Dr. Monkey Breath. That's a pretty cool name, I like that. Um, how much do you know about keeping Thai flat millipedes? I haven't kept a whole lot of flat millipedes, just a little here and there. So I don't know much about it, I must say. It sounds cool. But I don't, I don't know a whole lot about it. Okay. I'm going to do something a little tricky now. Here we go. You ready for this? This species is going to be more complicated, perhaps. Okay. So, sick. Just started keeping ice puzzles. That'll be better to first start with native ones from the woods nearby. Got some... I guess I got some Procellia scaber. Any quick tips? Those are pretty easy to do. If you can start out with a decent number of them so they're not overwhelmed by pests, that's always helpful. Um, they do like uh, lots of good places to hide, give them plenty of leaf litter, and enough moisture, but not too much. Protein once in a while, like fish food pellets, and that would be cool. 
Oh yeah, Finger Lake Feeders has got some really cool stuff. He's working a lot with Oniscus acellus. And here we go. We're going to do this species and then I'll go to the questions. So what do you think these guys are? Anybody got this one? Oh! It looks like Thoropods got it. Thoropods got it. Yep, you did. Silistixus convexus pied. Very interesting uh, pied formation. They look kind of unique. They're almost tiger striped, a lot of them. They look so different from anything else that's pied to me. So I really like them. Uh, more of a pattern than most Dalmatian, than Porcelos Scaber Dalmatian. Just different. So very cool. Really like these. These came from Laura at Smugbug. So aquatic isopods, amphibious aquatics. I have actually kept quite a few different types of aquatic isopods. Started out with a kind I collected in a ditch, an irrigation ditch near my home when I was about 13 years old. So many, 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 many years ago. And kept them. They were breeding in my aquarium. I had them in a 10 gallon aquarium. They were breeding in there just fine. It was really cool. Really liked them. And uh, then I didn't keep them for very long though because I put newts in the aquarium as I remember and they ate them, which was dumb. But I was 13, so what do I do? Um, and then later I kept marine aquaria for a number of years. And as I did, there were many, many isopods that lived in, in them. Many species of small aquatic isopods. Not, nothing big, but lots of them that would dwell in the live rock and crawl around on the substrate and on the glass and eat algae and things like that. So they were very cool. Really liked them. Oh, make it Kate. Hello. Nice to see you in here. And sick. Oh, that is cool. The tricolor um, Marulanella isopods. I totally want those someday. I need to get a permit to get them shipped in to me, but I don't have them. Um, and Newt, I guess you would know. That's true. You would know. And uh, I can't really blame you. What can I say? Can't blame you. All right. I'm going to show you something that had babies the other day. <laughs> Here we go. It's another new enclosure, so yep, we got the fungus nets. It happens. But look at the size of this one. Crikey! Look at the size of him! He's a real beauty, or oh, she, I don't really know right now. And yes, it is magic potion. It's roughly the size of a barge, indeed. So this is a magic potion. It's an orange Dalmatian magic potion. So cloud 9.5, make it cake, cloud 9.5, I mean, thoropods, you're right. And these are, these are really big. And I noticed some babies in here the other day, which is good because that'll mean they'll soon be out competing in the, uh, the fungus nets. Mm, that's cool, sick. E ecospheres are pretty interesting. The ones that you can actually get a a nice population going in of self-sustaining critters. Pretty cool. Harder to do than you might think, but very cool. I'm just going to see if I can see any babies in here. I just, I was in here doing maintenance the other day and saw some babies. I'm going to make sure I don't get too much leaf litter over the moss because that causes problems with this fungus nets if you do that too much. And yeah, this one, I mean, I don't know what it is about these, but they are big. So, Sick, um, which country are you in as, as far as isopods go? That can help us narrow it down a little bit. <laughs> I 
Yeah, Steve Irwin. What a guy. Reed frogs. Finn. Hmm. I've never kept reed frogs. They sound cool, though. Thanks for joining in, Forest Oasis. Always nice to have you in. Let's see if we can get a good look at this one, huh? Can we? Good close-up look without too much glare. You can see one in the bottom right corner. Cyan geckos, hello! Hey, I, I would love to have isopod powers, Newt. What would you have? You'd, you'd be armored, right? You'd be able to roll up into an armored ball and just like roll away from danger. Uh, let's see, what else could you do if you were a radioactive? If you were bitten by a radioactive isopod and had powers as a consequence, what would it be? What would your powers be? Let's see. Yeah, sick, you could probably get a ton. Europe is a, is a good place to get isopods, so do some zebras, definitely. Do some ornatus. Do some... Uh, those are some good ones to start with. This isn't a bad one to start with either, although I'm starting with it much later than most people. I recently got these. They do, they do need the things that uh, Spanish isopods need, basically. Good moisture gradient, so dry side. They like, they're somewhat... They're climbers, and they, they walk high up on their legs, higher than many, and they're climbers, so you need some good uh, surfaces for them to climb on. Let's see. And invertebrates, well, the idea behind... Um, you know, the fact that some of the invertebrates in the past grew much bigger than they do now is in part due to the oxygen-rich environments of the time. It may have to do also with the, the food chain at the time. Okay, Finn. Zebra isopods do breed fairly constantly, but they, you can find kind of a, a balance with some... You know, there's a carrying capacity the enclosure will reach to some extent if you're careful. And uh, let's see. Room temperature is basically fine. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, Ireland, you might have a slightly cooler room temperature than you do here, but yeah, they should be fine. Mickey M, hello. So Hoffman's egg guy is not a bad one to start with either. They're actually pretty, uh, so they're pretty cool. They're not the most active, um, if you want active, Ornatus, Dark South, or Yellow Dot is a great one. Zebras are a great one for activity. Um, powder Blues or any of the powders are great for activity. So these do have a skirt, but they're not the species known as skirted isopods. Let me see if I can uh, dredge up a few more here from the... Oh, there's a ton there, but can I even get them in the camera? Yeah, maybe. There we go. I can try. Get them in the camera there. I'm showing a bunch of new cultures this time, so you're getting a bunch of fungus gnats. Fun. Um, okay. So this is one I've only shown once, I think. But they're not high black hoffs. Hello, Codlos. Welcome. So, Finn, it, it kind of depends on how much food you offer and so on. With zebras, you might... Yeah, you might need to upgrade or, or just remove some and sell them. But it also depends on how much you feed them. If you're not feeding a lot of supplemental food and rely mostly on leaf litter, you might not have to do that. So. So anybody got this one? And Frank, I am considering your, your request. I'm just trying to figure out what I could show you that I haven't shown you recently. I got one. I got one. But I want somebody to tell me what these guys are first. What genus are these? Fair question. These are in the genus Porcelio. Mm. 
Oh, there's a bunch hiding up in here and stuff. I need to be careful. Don't want to let them fall out. Okay. Yep, Thoropods, you got it. Porcelio flavo marginatus. That is the one. So, I do have some black titans. Um, and these do look kind of like black titans, so I can totally see why you'd go there with that. Uh, but they're not black titans. But that's not too far off. Same genus. Fairly similar appearance in many ways. These have a, a thicker skirt and they have the white markings right along the median area of back that uh, the... Sorry, I just ripped my microphone off by accident. Um, and the, the Titans are also a long, more elongate species, but not, not too far off. Okay. Frank the Tank said, show something you don't usually show. Been a while since I've shown this. So here we go. Let's see if I can make this work. Yeah. I can. Okay. So whoever gets the species on this one is a winner. What do we got here? What is this? So some isopods seem to be more stressed by light exposure than others. Um, the ones that really don't seem to mind too much are things like Porcelionides prunosus, Porcelionides dairy cow, Porcelionides milkback, um, zebras, Armadillidae maculatum, uh, Porcelionides ornatus, uh, don't seem to mind as much. It is, oh, Frank to Tank, you got this. It's a stag beetle larva. Um, and the stag beetle larvae, I collected some cottonwood stag beetle larvae in my state about an hour away from here last July 4th. And I collected two males and two females, kept them together for a week or two, separated them, and got some larvae and in the female enclosures. And this is one of them. It looks like it's getting close to the size where it will uh, pupate. So it is indeed a cottonwood stag beetle larva, Pseudolucanus um, mazama, I believe is the scientific name there. Yeah, there was a live stream about it. I talked about collecting them and everything and showed them. So, and the substrate for them, let's take a peek at it, it is quite woody. This is uh, flake soil, and this, this batch came out a little less fermented than I would have liked. The, the batch before this was a little bit better. I'm not sure how I screwed up, but it's not bad. I mean, it still seems to be working for them, but the other batch was a little darker and seemed more fermented. Um, so yeah, that's that's the uh, one of the larvae. I have a few of them. I think I have three larvae. There were more originally, but um, I don't think I separated them fast enough. And some of them got to the other ones. So there you go. It happens. It's kind of sad, though. Okay, I got a couple more I want to show you. Just uh, sanitizing between them so I don't cause any problems. You know what I mean? This one's probably going to be easy to figure out. So, the formal top hat. I'm not too familiar with a clitorychus species um, so I, I don't really know I I do have Spirostreptus species one but I don't have that other one so I'm not sure let's see if you can tell which species this is just from looking at the front of the enclosure probably not sometimes you can just depends on the day and who's hanging out but some of you will recognize this enclosure already I think let's see Who's in here? Who's at home? Ooh, little baby. Did you see that little baby running by? That was fun. What are my thoughts on Mothra? Well, it was kind of sad to see it die in the movie, the Godzilla movie, a while ago. But... 
There's a little baby rubber ducky. Check it out. Um, I noticed a, a little tiny, a batch of really, really tiny duckies recently in here. Uh, so that was fun. But let's put that one back now. So Ike, I don't actually have any thumbnail dart frogs. I just have right now, um, I have Dendrobates leucomelis, and that is it. I, I'm intrigued by the thumbnails and wouldn't mind keeping thumbnails someday, but I don't have any at the moment. Okay, we're going to do this one now. This is a fun one. By the way, these enclosures from uh, tarantula cribs love these things. They're so fun. So much easier to see the isopods in them. Just fun enclosures. I love them. Newt, you got it. You got it. These are Oreo crumbles and another point to someone who can give me the scientific name as well. Newt got the common name immediately, which was awesome. There you go, Thoropods. P. pruinosis, or Porcelionides pruinosis. They're very fast. I only keep one other species that's faster than this, I think, and that's Florida fast. And Newt, you got the entire scientific name. Nice. You can see that there are a lot of babies in here. They're doing extremely well. I estimate I probably have over 100 in here. Uh, started out with around 20. And they've been doing well. Uh, just got them in October. And they're, you know, that's a fast breeding species. They do well. Oh, okay. Well, that helps, Mickey M. What is, do we have a common name for the uh, that species, Acladic Cricus or whatever it is? Um. <laughs> well, sick. I'm glad you're enjoying the isopods. And three times the girth, and they're going to be a more impressive, visually impressive uh, millipede. But I, I don't have any experience with that species, so maybe Mickey M can enlighten us about that. Um, hello, Matt M. Nice to see you. Oh, Philippine Blue. Okay. Yeah, I knew of the Philippine Blues. They were, you know, getting into the hobby around the time that I was, I guess. Or maybe they had been there longer. I don't know. It just seemed like they were coming in about that time. And... Okay, there's something else I want to show you. Let me... I'm gonna switch the camera around for just a minute. And here we go, boom. Check it out. This is my big old um, Desimutilla occidentala. She is a big velvet ant. She's about an inch long. And she's, she's beautiful. I love the red and black. Um, so there you go. So Eddie, that is a great question. Hard to answer. Hard to answer because it varies from day to day. Um, some days, you know, I can take hours um, on animal husbandry, but I do have something going for me, and that is I have two kids that work for me, uh, spending time taking care of my animals every day. So if you include their timing, um, then... Yeah, then it's it's going to be more, but I it'd be hard to give an estimate. So fearless, do you think one of them has ever climbed your arm and escaped without you knowing? Uh, one got on the lid and escaped, and we found it a little later, and it was still alive. It was running around, uh, so that was kind of scary, because if someone had stepped on that, it would have been bad in more way than one. But you know, we're usually pretty careful with that, and I keep the keep the branches down low enough so that they're not going to get cause those problems. Just wanted to kind of show you this velvet ant, Desimula vustita, having a little bit of 
bug jelly from Bugs in Cyberspace. This little lady drinking some nectar over here still. And this one chilling out on the branch. Basking, it looks like. Um, let's see. Let's see, I haven't worked with the Odd Pet. I've, I've seen some of their stuff online, but I haven't purchased anything from them. So. Rodrigo, welcome. So the formal tap hat, do you have trypophobia? All of these velvet ants are living. Yep, the white one is alive and doing her thing. <laughs> Beautiful but horrifying. Well, they do pack quite a sting. So, yeah, I, the reason why I ask formal top hat is because my daughter has trypophobia and certain things with regular, uh, like, depressions in them really bother her. I don't think choya wood bothers her a lot. The branches, these particular branches don't bother her, but certain plants where they have things like that or um, Suriname toads really bother her, you know, a, a, a female carrying eggs or we will, or that an adult carrying eggs will bother her a lot. So this, these velvet ants are actually collected in my state, state of Utah, southwestern corner of the state is part of the Mojave Desert. And that's where they were collected. My cousin, Joe, who has a, a YouTube channel all about bees and wasps and things of that sort. Um, he's an entomologist, studies evolutionary biology and focuses a lot on velvet ants and other uh, solitary wasps and bees was kind enough to give these to me. He collected them and was using them for a, a research project that he uh, did and then said, I, I will give you these because um, you seem to be able to take care of them well. And so that was nice of him. So if you want to check out his channel, it's, it's called The Bees in Your Backyard. He's also on Instagram. has a lot of followers on Instagram. Um, so Ken, you know what we ought to do sometime? If you ever want to collaborate, we could do a video of you um, out finding things and collecting things for this vivarium and putting it together or something like that. That would be fun. So fearless, larger beetles, it depends on the species and, and how large you mean. Some beetles only live about a year, year and a half, some less. And some of them will live several years. I mean, the blue death vein beetles can live 17. Mm. And yeah, let's do it. So let's see. So Ken, yeah, yeah, let's chat about it when, when you get closer. I would love that. And Nuno, this is a flightless wasp, a wingless wasp, so close. And any changes to the aquariums? Well, let's see. Yeah, I've been, I've actually been doing an interesting thing with my goldfish aquarium. I have a huge mat of water lettuce on the surface of it. I've got two different kinds of pothos growing out of it. So I'm doing kind of an aquaponics thing. And the the um, the water lettuce is growing like crazy and I have to just take out chunks of it and, and in bags take it out every week because they grow like crazy and it's really good because it's a good way to export nutrients from the goldfish tank they're just two goldfish in a 54 gallon tank but still a lot of nutrients huh. where's she going I love the way they, they walk it's just it's fascinating hey crystal Hello, and I'm glad that you and Clara are enjoying my videos. That's awesome. Um, oh, Ken, we got to do it with the 4K camera. Yeah, there's a lot of red and black velvet ants, partly because there are some Mullerian mimicry rings going on. In other words, a lot of species are mimicking each other because they're all, they've all pack a punch in terms of a sting, and it, it makes sense for them all to resemble each other because... Anybody who's, any animal who's had a run-in with one red and black velvet ant is not likely to want to repeat the experience, and they don't have to look exactly the same. They just follow this pattern, so it's a very common one. Um, and I actually have a tailless whip scorpion right now, Eddie. Who would like to see the tailless whip scorpion? Uh, we're almost, it's almost time to finish, but we could do that if you all want to. And a formal top hat. The subscribe catfish is actually, uh, it's a, I believe a tiger shovel nose catfish that belongs to my local aquarium. And one day I filmed it and I thought, huh, I wonder if I could, I could do that and make it work. Um, 
do the, the subscribe thing. So I did, and it worked, and it was fun, and so I kept it, and I've kept it all these years. It's been, it's been a while. I don't even know when, the, when I first put that on there, but it's been years, and uh, people like it. A lot of people have told me that they subscribed for the catfish. So <laughs> I'm glad I put it there. I'm, it was an inspiration, I guess, to use it. I am now attempting to get my Taylor Whip Scorpion out of her enclosure. I have to, you know, kind of coax her out carefully because they're kind of fragile and kind of skittish. So it's something you don't really want to hurry too much. But I, I guess this is something I don't show too often on the channel. I mean, I've shown it before. It's not too often. So Frank Detink, I hope this kind of um, goes with that. So here's my Taylor Swift Scorpion. Or Taylor Swift Scorpion, whichever one you want. Harry Potter Spider. It has so many different names. Whip Spider. Of course, it's not a true scorpion. It's not a true spider, but it is an arachnid. A true arachnid. And those antenniform legs are out of this world. The pedipalps are out of this world. And if you look really close, you can see the chelicerae. And those are also out of this world. Okay. So some pseudoscorpions. I would like to get some. My daughter would like to get some as well. If I can source some for a decent price, I will do it. I think they would be so fun and they wouldn't take up much space. iBugman, nice to see you here. We're just checking out the velvet ants a minute ago. Actually, iBugman sent me some of my velvet ants. The smaller red one that you saw came from him. And one of my orange ones that were not appearing in this film, they didn't want to come out today, It's from him. And my two smaller red ones are from him. So. So, yeah, I love these things. I'm going to try to get a male. Started out with a, a trio of tiny little babies, captive bred babies. Sorry. She's crawling up my arm, so it's going to take a second to get her back in the shot. That's just how this creature rolls. I'm not going to hurry her too much because you don't, you don't hurry things like tailless whip scorpions, even if they're crawling up your arm and you want to... Uh, Show them to people. So, just a second. There. I was I was very careful, uh, but um, okay. Where are we going? Sorry, I think I missed some of the the chat, but I don't know that I'm going to recall all of it. They do prefer some height because that helps them molt. So her enclosure is a 12 by 12 by 12 exoterra. We're lined with cork bark on three sides, and then she's got a cork bark ramp in there as well. And that seems to work really well. Helps with molting and everything. Um, I do have a video, if you want to check it out, of her eating and catching a cricket in her enclosure. It's pretty cool. It actually went sort of viral, and it's got over like 180,000 views or something, which is kind of fun. But yeah, yeah it was, uh, I think it's about a year and a half ago when, when I posted that video, something like that. Uh, I do have a scorpion too. I have a an Asian forest scorpion. So yeah, this one is a female in this species, which is not true of all species. The pedipalps, the the joint, the distal joint of the pedipalps, is shorter than the. Uh, first joint of the first pair of walking legs, and you can see that fairly well in this shot that they are. And in the males, the uh, distal joint of the pedipalps is much, in mature males, distal joint of the pedipalps extends far past that first joint of the uh, first pair of walking legs. So, yep, I, I did have a male, and he was beautiful, and we had a, an overhydration problem with him. His enclosure got too much water dumped in it. And that did not go well, which is sad. So um, I am going to seek out another male. And everybody knows now that that is not what one does with Taylor's Whip Scorpions. So. So. 
So, fearless, formal top hat, you've messaged me on Facebook? I am really bad with Facebook, but I do try to check on it. So, um, you can try again. Instagram is always better if you have that. But uh, I will try to check if, if you, did a, if you uh, message me again. And Crystal, glad to hear that Clara likes to collect your native isopods. That's awesome. Uh, that's a great way to start with isopods. And M14, yes, you are right. And Okay, well, you know what? It's about time for me to go. I, I went over a little bit, but I'm glad that I did because you get to meet this lovely lady if you haven't already. She is pretty beautiful. And um, you'll probably see her again soon in another video. Within the next month or two, um, there's going to be a video uh, in which she will be have a, a prominent role. So um, thank you everyone for joining in. And I hope you all have a, a lovely week. Check out my video coming up on Friday. Everybody stay healthy and stay safe. And Happy New Year.